You know, I, I think it's indisputable that TAS and uh, Rego, you know, are part of our day of, of our routine practice, but can we do better by using target approaches like immunotherapy or different approaches? So again, I mentioned this earlier, the idea of palliative therapy is to extend duration of life, maintain quality of life as long as possible. And the question is, can we use immunotherapy to do exactly that? You know, regoraftib and TAS-102, they work, but they don't work well. We would like to see more data, more efficacy, you know, the survival benefits in the range of 1.4 to 1.8 months in median. And, you know, there's no difference in PFS because more than 50% of patients actually have progression of disease the first time we actually do a scan. This is the comparison. This is TAS-102. This is regorafenib. You want to see that again? This is progression-free survival TAS-102. This is regorafenib. They are identical. They work, but they don't work well. And you see the side effects we see with regorafenib. Is this really what we want to do in a later line setting? Now, this is something we've learned to manage better. And there are dosing strategies which are being employed right now. But in a later line setting, when patients are about to go to hospice, is this what we want to see? Can we do better? Yes, we can. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> really good old days. Yeah, anyway. OK. So immunotherapy, and we'll talk about this a lot. You know, we're targeting the hypermutated phenotype, which can be related to MSR high tumors, mismatch repair deficient cancers. We know that MSR high tumors in colon cancer, the prevalence of prognosis stage dependent, better prognosis in earlier stage, worse prognosis in stage four, but you only have four to five percent of patients with metastatic colorectal cancer really being MSR high tumors. And we know that PD-1, PDL-1 blockade works in these patients from really prominent publications. This is really something that changed the way we look at these cancers, published actually in 2015, PD-1 blockade with pembrolizumab. And the study design initially was really to test the biomarker of mismatch repair deficiency in colorectal cancers and in non-colorectal cancers. And as you know, with most of these patients with colorectal cancer in this study were Lynch syndrome patient, and we'll have a lot of discussions about immunotherapy later. For the sake of my argument here, these were patients who were later aligned, uh, in a later line setting, and the biomarker of mismatch repair deficiency really worked to dichotomize patients to response versus no response with a response rate in this small study at 28 patients of about 57% compared to 0% with MSS tumors just using pembrolizumab, a single agent, and there's clear difference in overall survival. These th drugs work, and I think they, at least NCCN guidelines have acknowledged them as standard of care in a salvage therapy setting or later line setting from second line therapy on in MSR high tumors. And we have seen data from nivolumab with or without ipilimumab. That is a class effect of immunotherapy agents. Now, the problem is they only make up 5% of tumors. So the challenge is right now, how can we make these 95% of patients, 95% of tumors in colorectal cancer, immunogenic? So we are talking about, you know, we consider some tumors are inflamed. We already have CT, uh, CD8 uh, positive T cell infiltrated, but they're not functional yet. This is where we kick them into gear by using pembrolizumab, nivolumab, atezolizumab. Then we have uh, tumors which we call immune excluded, where T cells are accumulated, so they're primed, but they're not yet infiltrated. Those where we need to bring T cells into the cancer and then activate the activated T cells into the cancer and then use PD-1 antibodies. And then there's this area of this immune desert, which uh, the T cells are absent from tumor and periphery. So we need to really prime these T cells first in order to do that. So now we have some data already in, in, in place where we see that the modulation of these factors by additional inhibitors, biologic inhibitors actually can help us bring T cells and activate T cells into the tumor. We know that MEK inhibition can actually lead to an increase in the CD8 positive tumor cell, T cells per tumor cell. So we can activate T cells and they live longer when we add a MEK inhibitor, for instance, into the mix. We can improve the visibility of tumor cells by increasing the presentation of MHC1 class 
um, uh, agents, uh, antigens on the surface of these tumors. And we can actually see some preclinical efficacy when we see, when we combine a MEK inhibitor with an anti PD1, PDL1 antibody. So these are preclinical data which now have been translated into clinical practice using the cobimetinib and tezolizumab combination. They have generated a lot of attention. Now, atezolizumab is not a PD-1 antibody, it's a PDL one antibody, it re reacts against the ligand, and it was added to the cobimetinib MEK inhibitor in a very interesting phase one, phase one B study, which has generated a lot of interest. So, admittedly, we're talking about few patients, we're talking about three patients here in a dose escalation stage and then a dose expansion stage of 20 patients with KRAS mutant tumors. Now keep in mind that in MSS tumors, in this patient population, cobimetinib alone and atezolizumab alone have 0% response rate. Nothing happens. Now, these patients here in this study, 23 patients, again, 20 patients, the expansion cohort, had, were heavily pretreated, and most patients here in this setting were MSS. There's one patient where we don't know the data. Response rate in this expansion cohort of 20 patients was 20%, meaning four patients. We get excited about four patients because zero plus zero, when you add it up here, equals 20% response rate. But that's not the only thing. What I find most intriguing, and this is MSS tumors, is the durability of response. Talk about a last line setting, and you saw the limited data in terms of duration of response for patients with uh, TAS-102 and regorafenib. You can see if patients had a response, those four patients who had a response, this is months down here. La last line setting, median survival for the whole group, 17.6 months with cobimetinib and tezolizumab. Again, we're only talking about four responders, but patients had stable disease, had long-term stable disease in some of them. That is the intriguing part, the duration of response. You see the swimmer plot here. This is something we've not seen yet in a salvage therapy setting. L clearly better, and you know, limited numbers, but if you say, do it side by side, better than what we see with regorafenib or TAS-102. Now, the uh, Cortezo study actually compared cobimetinib and tezolizumab, this is the box here, to a tezolizumab single agent, the Sorry that it didn't come across in regorafenib as a control arm here in a two to one to one randomization. The study opened and closed in note, in really in record time, showing you how excited people are about the cobimetinib metazolizumab combination. This is really where we like to go for the MSS tumors. So, conclusion immunotherapy, we have shown proof of principle in metastatic colorectal cancer. NCCN considers PD-1 antibodies a standard of care for the MSI high mismatch repair deficient colorectal cancers in later lines of therapy. And we have very intriguing data on the combination of a MEK inhibitor with a PD-L1 inhibitor in the MSS mismatch repair proficient cancers. Not necessarily the numbers of patients that responded, but the durability of response. And the phase three trial has been completed, data are awaited, and they are, you know, we are hopefully going to see this, that this intriguing data from phase 1b actually relates back into a phase 3 setting. So if you, had a, if you had the choice for yourself, would you use regorafenib with TAS-102 or cobimetinib with tezolizumab based on the data that I showed you? Now please vote. Thank you. <laughs>